Hello, and thank you for joining the Arc of Fort Bend County Parent Education and Support Group meeting on Zoom today. This group meets at 11 a.m. on the second Thursday each month throughout the school year. We start with an educational presentation, and then I invite you to stick around after the presentation if you'd like to bounce any questions and ideas off of each other for the support portion of our group. My name is Carrie Axtell, and I'm the Advocacy and Youth Programs Director here at the Arc of Fort Bend County. We're a nonprofit organization established in 1968 for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD. We ensure opportunities for people with IDD and their families to maximize their quality of life within our community. We do that through disability rights advocacy for and with people with IDD. We provide information about community services and resources, organize resource fairs, support groups for parents, as well as teen and adult siblings. We also hold several social and recreational programs for people in their teens, 20s, and into mature adulthood. We're also home to the largest Special Olympics delegation for adults in the region, offering 10 different sports with over 100 athletes. To learn more about the Arc of Fort Bend County, you can visit our website, arcoffortbend.org, and check out our Instagram and Facebook pages. You can also reach out to me, and I'll put my contact information in the chat box. When you logged on, you may have noticed that your microphone's on mute, and that's just to help cut down on background noise and help us hear our presenter better. But if you do have questions during the presentation, please uh, feel free to unmute and ask our presenter, John Oldham, um, your question. Or if you're more comfortable with using the chat box, please feel free to use that as well, and I can read your questions to John as well. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We have some exceptional professionals here in the community who share their knowledge and expertise with us. This month, we are very pleased to welcome John Oldham, the Fort Bend County Elections Administrator, to talk about voter registration and accommodations in Fort Bend County. Mr. Oldham is a native of Evansville, Indiana, and is a graduate of Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. He has served as a county clerk in Massac County, Illinois, and is a former adjunct, adjunct fac, uh, faculty member at Shawnee Community College in Ulan, Illinois, teaching government and economics. Mr. Oldham began working in elections in 1974 and is a certified election administrator by the Election Center and Auburn University. Before coming to Fort Bend County, he worked 18 years for, the, for election vendors, managing system installs, and has supported elections in 26 different states. Mr. Oldham has appointed, was appointed the Fort Bend County Elections Administrator in 2008. And he's also the past president of the Texas Association of Elections Administrators. So I'm very pleased to welcome John Oldham. I turn the presentation over to you, John. Thank you, Carrie. I hope this is a good learning experience. It's already been one for me because I've just learned about some of the good work that ARC does. I had no idea that that involved in Special Olympics and, and other things. So that's very interesting. Um, one of the things that we'll, I'll just begin with, it's not part of the slide, but to point out that elections in the United States are very disjointed. Um, up until the late or until the 80s, elections were almost wholly left to the states. We've had some federal legislation uh, happen that basically dealt with voter registration and also uh, equipment purchasing to upgrade equipment. But by and large, it's still in the hands of the states and localities. In Texas, we have um, the, the, there is a central a chief election official, the secretary of state, but elections are still functions of the counties, the cities, the schools. Um, Texas is kind of unique. Most states, um, well, some work this way, but really and truly are every one of our political subdivisions. And by a political subdivision, I mean a school district or a city or a town or a municipal utility district are responsible for their own conducting their own elections. However, in Fort Bend, they all contract with our office and we do it for them. Uh, that's not the case everywhere. And the same is true of the political parties, but uh, there's some things that are common to every county. Uh, and one is in Texas and is relatively common throughout the country due to the National Voter Registration Act, and that is registering to vote. Um, every, almost every state with, uh, with the exception of a couple require registration. Um, most have a, a waiting period after you register to before you can vote. Some have same day registration. 
but it, it so there's some variations there. Voting is where we see differences among the states and the counties in terms of how you can vote, when you can vote. Um, we hear a lot about Texas being uh, somewhat repressive. However, uh, we probably offer more opportunity to vote than almost any other state we have. For example, in Fort Bend County, well, throughout Texas, we'll have two weeks of early voting. And we'll have, in our county, 28 places people can do that. Some states don't even have early voting. And some states like Illinois only do it in one location. So it's, uh, it's you know, we have a lot of opportunity to vote. But again, let's get on with this. Um, if there's two, two steps to processing, to, to voting. One is you have to register. That means that you have to sign up. You be name goes on the voter rolls. And if you're there, then you can vote. If you're not, you generally cannot. Um, but to participate in the voting process, you have to be 18 years of age by election day. You have to be a resident of the political subdivision in order to vote in their election. So in other words, if you're a resident of Texas, you can vote in Texas elections. If you're a resident of Sugarland, you can vote in Sugarland elections. Um, the, if you're a resident of Sugarland and Bernie Road Mud, you can vote in their elections. So it's, uh, you have to be a resident of the political subdivision in order to receive a ballot with their propositions or candidates. Uh, and again, political subdivisions include counties, cities, school districts, utility districts, levy improvement districts, so on and so forth. Also in Texas, and this is not the case in every state, but it is in most, you have to be registered for a period of time prior to election day. And in Texas, it's 30 days. Some states, it used to be a year up to six months, but by and large, most of them are around the 28 to 30 day period now. So that, and there's reasons for that. That can make, ensures that you're on the voter rolls so that when you go to vote, you, they can find you. They can find your name, address, and your eligibility and which districts you're entitled to vote in. Now, who can register to vote? You have to be number one, a citizen of the United States. You have to be 18 by the next election. And you have to be a resident of the county in which you wish to register. So if you live in Fort Bend, you can register in Fort Bend. You can't re register in Oklahoma. Um, now, some people have more than one residence, and which is not, it was okay under the laws of Texas. You should though register at your primary residence. Uh, one thing anybody wants to avoid doing is being registered in two places, and certainly you don't wanna vote in two places. Uh, also, you cannot have been convicted of a felony and if you have been convicted of a felony, you have to complete all conditions of your sentence. In other words, if you're incarcerated or if you are um, on probation, that has to be, be finished uh, before you can register to vote again, because once you're convicted of a felony, we cancel your registration. Also, a person must not have been judged incompetent to vote by a court of law. You can be incompetent in terms of financial affairs, but still have the right to vote. So it's a very specific requirement. I'm not even sure I've, of our 500,000 people, if we have anybody in Fort Bend County who has, has a court order that says they're not capable of voting. Um, also in Texas, just to point out, we do not register to vote by political party. Some states do, for example, my kids live in Kentucky. When you register to vote in Kentucky, you register as a Republican or you register as a Democrat um, or you register as an independent. If you do an independent, you can't vote in a primary. If you do as a Democrat, you can only vote in the Democrat primaries unless you go back to the courthouse, cancel your registration and re-register. Te uh, in Texas, we declare party affiliation when we actually go to the polls. So it's not a, uh, it's not a permanent thing. It, it, you can change from year to year. Um, if you are a registered voter already, it's important that you keep your registration information up to date. If you change your name, you should re-register. If you get married, you should re-register. If you change your address, you should notify our elect the election office. You don't have to register again unless you move to a different county in Texas. So if you live in Harris and you move to Fort Bend, and you were registered in Harris, 
your registration does not transfer. You have to register anew. Now, if you move from one residence in Fort Bend to another, you can make corrections to your registration. You can do so by putting that information on your voter certificate by contacting our office or going online to either uh, to what's called votetexas.gov, or you can also do it at the DPS website. Now, once you are registered, you can vote in any election where you reside that's being conducted. Now, te Texas has two what's called uniform election dates every year. One is in May, one is in November. The one in May is generally when cities and schools and other minor political subdivisions conduct their elections. November is when we have federal, state, and county elections, although some of our minor political subdivisions have removed their elections to November. For example, Missouri City holds their elections in November. Weston Lakes holds their no elections in November. In even-numbered years, we also have primary elections. We also may have runoff elections, and sometimes we have special elections. We've had a number of those in, here in Fort Bend, usually they're to fill vacancies in the legislature. Primary elections are when our two major political parties hold elections to nominate candidates and to elect their party officials. Party officials are like precinct chairs, precinct captains, party chairs, county chairs. Uh, these are the people who organize and run the, the business affairs of the political party. The main, main thing that happens at primaries is our two major political parties in Texas nominate candidates because you have um, you may have 10 people who want to be county clerk, but only one from each party will go on the ballot in November for to stand for election. So once these you have a primary, candidates will appear on then the winning candidate will appear on the November general election ballots. Now voters can choose to participate in either party's primary. Again, as I mentioned, we don't register by party, but say in 2022, if you went to primary, you would be asked, do you wanna vote in the Republican primary or the Democrat primary? If you say neither one, I'm an independent, you won't get a ballot. But if you say I want a Democrat primary, you're affiliating with that party for the, the, this year. If you said Republican, you're affiliating with the Republicans for this year. In 2024, you're free to change. Now, the only thing is in a runoff election, you have to vote the same party that you did in the primary. Now in Texas, we elect by plurality. Um, all of our, with the exception of president, all of our congressional um, uh, or state offices, uh, um, county offices uh, generally elect by plurality, which means you have to get 50% of the vote plus one vote. In other words, so if you have two people running, somebody's gonna get nominated um, or elected. If you have multiple people running, if they say three or four, it's quite possible that nobody will get 50% of the vote. So in a primary, we often see runoff elections between Two, de two Democrats or two Republicans to determine who will be the nominee of their party. We also will get uh, some of our cities elect by plurality. Sugarland does, Missouri City does, uh, um, I believe Fulcher does, so uh, Rosenberg does. So in other words, if you have three people running for mayor and nobody gets 50% of the vote um, in May, the May election, there will be a runoff to actually elect a mayor. So that's, a, that's kind of a thing that's unique to the South. Among our 50 states, there's only maybe less than a dozen that actually do require plurality vote. Um, some municipalities in other states do, but not, it's not as common as it is in the, in this, particularly in the South and, and uh, uh, some areas of the West. Now, how do you vote? I mean, obviously we said you have to be registered, um, but you can vote in person during the early voting period. You can vote in person on election day, or you can vote by mail. Let me back up here. Yes. Now to vote in person, 
everybody has to show photo identification. That's for identification purposes and not to verify your address. You will be asked to verify your address, but we take your word for it. Um, but the, Texas has had a photo ID law for a number of years now. And the, there's a number of acceptable forms of ID which you will be asked to present. The most common 90% of our voters show a Texas driver's license issued by the Department of Public Safety. Now this has to be a current, it has to be valid. It can be expired by uh, uh, for a short period of time. Um, if you're over 70, it can be expired indefinitely. There's also what's called an election identification certificate for people who don't drive, which can be issued by DPS. Its only purpose is a, is a form of identification for voting. I honestly believe that nobody in Fort Bend County has been issued one of these. We do have people who have personal ID cards. These are sometimes people who used to drive but no longer drive um, or who never chose to drive, but it's much like, a, it looks almost exactly like a driver's license, but it's not a driver's license, just used for identification. A Texas handgun license issued by DPS is also an acceptable form of ID for voting. A military identification card with a photograph is a US citizenship certificate where somebody has been naturalized if it contains a photograph or your passport, either the booklet or the card, if it has a photograph. Again, this is for identification. So any of these government issued documents have to have photo ID. Uh, many of us who were born more than 30 years ago or 40 years ago have birth certificates that do not have ID or have, I'm sorry, that might've been naturalized 30 years ago. Their naturalization papers do not have photos. So they would not be acceptable. But again, this is strictly for identification. The address on this ID does not have to match the address at which you're registered. You can be registered in Fort Bend County and your driver's license says El Paso, and it could still be an acceptable form of ID. Now, what if you don't have an ID? If a voter does not possess or cannot reasonably obtain one of the approved forms of ID, they can still vote by executing what is called a reasonable impediment declaration and, support, and present supporting documents that have their address. Um, some of these would include like a voter certificate, utility bill, birth certificate um, without the photo ID. Well, the birth certificates don't have it. The, um, um, if it's mail, it has to be addressed to you. It can't be addressed to somebody else in your household. Um, but again, it's, it's not difficult to vote do, executing this form. Now, the form would be used not for somebody who left their license at home. Those, they should go back and get it. But it's used by somebody who perhaps moved to Texas recently. They didn't have the required documentation like a birth certificate to get issued a driver's license. And so they've had to contact, say, the voter, the, the uh, Department of Health in Connecticut to get a copy of the birth certificate, and it hasn't arrived yet. So these would be somebody who's, you know, might be reasonably, uh, can't reasonably obtain the information they need in order to get an ID. Maybe it's somebody who can't drive and has no transportation to DPS. So there's a number of reasons why people might not have an ID um, or the but again, you can use this reasonable impediment declaration along with your voter card uh, or a birth certificate or a utility bill, a uh, letter from the government, letter from public health or uh, um, a governmental agency addressed to you that in order to document your identity. Hey, now, John, before you move on from reasonable impediment, I actually have a question about that. Um, so for, the people that, and I see that it's probably a pretty rare thing for somebody to, to, to use a reasonable impediment, but is that something that they would bring up on the day of election, or is that something that they would probably bring to you or bring to the election no, they place? Do, they do it in person on election day or during the early voting period. Um, and usually, probably, we may have, um, in this coming November election, we may have three to 400 of these. Most of them are people who've lost their driver's license. And haven't gotten another one yet. 
So, um, and for example, I lost mine one time and I, I've got it before the next election, but people do lose things that are your uh, purse is stolen, whatever. And if it's stolen the week of the election, you probably don't have time to go get a replacement, which actually you would get a replacement for it, uh, a printout, and then your, your license don't come in the mail. Now that re document that they would issue as a temporary would also be an acceptable form of ID. So, but again, the, the, we don't have a lot of people to do this, but it is a fail safe mechanism for folks that do not have access to, uh, to DPS. And, and we gotta remember that we, in Texas, we have some counties that the nearest DPS office may be 200 miles away. We have one here, we have a couple of them here, and we have some nearby, but other places out in West Texas, that they're, they're not close. So it's, it's not as easy to obtain. Okay, voting early in person. Um, generally for federal and state elections, we have a, um, 17 days of early voting. It, I'm sorry, we have two weeks of early voting. It begins 17 days before an election and ends four days before. So for a Tuesday election, on, it'll end on Friday at 7 p.m. Or if you're still in line, you get to stay in line until you get to vote. In November 20 this year, we will have 28 early voting locations scattered throughout the, the county. They're all going to be open for voting 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. We do have some sites, about half of them, that will be open from uh, noon until 5 p.m. on Sunday. Not all of them are because some of them are in churches and that doesn't work too well you know, with the sermon. Um, but we do have ample opportunities for early voting. Um, now in city school elections, it's actually 12 days of early voting rather than 17. Uh, I'm sorry, rather than eight. Um, now anybody who's registered in Fort Bend County can cast a ballot at any early voting site. If you live in Fulcher and you're working in say your office in Sugarland, you could go down to the Sugarland branch library on Eldridge and vote, or you could go over to um, our early voting site that we have at the uh, uh, one of the Fort Bend ISD campuses and cast a ballot. So you can vote anywhere. Um, and that's always been the case with early voting in Texas. And that's the case in every county in the state, although some small counties may only have one early voting site. And ours vary. We had uh, last spring, we had 24. This November, we'll have 28. Now, voting on election day. Historically in Texas, we voted by what's called precinct at assigned polling locations. And half of our counties in Texas still do that. And these are locations that hopefully are in the neighborhood where we live. Um, in 2015, we were applied for and were approved to adopt a countywide polling place plan so that it works just like early voting. You can cast a ballot at any polling location in the county. Harris County just adopted this last year, which helps us because people listen to Harris County media and they were getting misinformation for our county and, and some of the other ones surrounding us. Um, in November of this year, we anticipate 79 election day sites. And again, if you live in Brookshire, um, or not Brookshire, that's Waller, we have some Brookshire voters. If you live in Kendleton and you're working in Missouri City, you don't have to rush back to Kendleton to vote. You can vote at any site that's open in Missouri City or somewhere along the, the road. We tried to uh, uh, move our, when we adopted this plan, we tried to shift most of our election day sites to thoroughfares so that they're on dry, you know, close to or slightly off of major thoroughfares that people might use to commute to work or back home. Um, we did eliminate about 25 sites when we did that. Uh, but again, some of these sites were across the street from one another because they were unique to a given precinct. So we, we literally did in several instances have polling location for one precinct that was directly across the street from a polling location for another uh, site. And this helped in, uh, tremendously in terms of 
people being disenfranchised by going to the long, wrong location. If, if uh, somebody was supposed to vote at First Colony Conference Center and they went to Sugarland City Hall, they couldn't vote. And if it was the end of the day on election day, they were out of luck. Now you can vote anywhere, which is a boon we feel to, to our voters. It's more challenging to us because we don't know where people are going to go and we have to be adequately staffed and have enough equipment and sites to uh, deal with that ambiguity. Now, voting equipment. Um, three years ago, or in, actually in the summer of 2020, we changed our voting system. We had what was called a direct recorded electronic system. In other words, that people would mark things on a screen and then it would save their ballot electronically. Uh, we did use that for 15 years. Um, the, uh, in two years ago, we went to a, what's called an electronic ballot marking device that works like a direct recorded or touch screen but you put a blank ballot in, you make your choice, see your choices for contests, districts on the screen, and you make your choices for candidates or choices on propositions, whatever. When you're done, you can review that and then print your ballot. So, and then that ballot is tabulated in a freestanding in precinct scanner that not only takes a picture of the ballot, um, so in case something happened to the originals, we would have that as a backup but it also records the votes and then at the end of the night tallies them. Um, all of our voting equipment is accessible to voters with disabilities. Half of our voting stations can accommodate a wheelchair and each marking device has audio functionality. We also have a separate device to be used for what we call curbside voting. How does this system work? Well, I've got a short video here put out by our vendor election systems and software that kind of explains how the what they call the express vote that's the ballot marking device works so i'm going to pop this start this up it lasts about between two and a half three minutes welcome to express vote universal voting system in question by all voters including those with special needs to make their selections please take a few moments to watch this video to learn how to make your selections quickly and easily Hey, John, is there a way to just increase the volume a little bit? To up it? Yes, please. I, I think I've got it as loud as it will go, okay. unfortunately. Next, make your selections on the touch screen by touching the box with the candidate's name. Once chosen, your selection will change colors. You can easily navigate through the election contests by touching the options labeled next and previous. You may change the language displayed by pressing languages at the top of the screen. The language displayed can be changed at any time when voting. If you have visual limitations, you can use the contrast option to change the screen to high contrast black and white. Selecting the zoom function makes the text appear larger on the screen. Step three, verify selections. After you have made all of your selections, it's time to review them on screen to confirm your choices. Once satisfied with your selections, print your card by navigating to the next screen. Print your card by touching the print card option. Your printed card will be returned to you from the same slot on the front of the express vote device. Step four, scan. Now it's time to insert your voted card into the DES 200 digital scan. Cast your selections. Thank you for taking the time to learn how to use the Express Vote Universal Voting System, enhancing your voting experience. For more information, visit ESSVote.com. Now, I'll point out the video didn't point this out, but this system works well for persons who frack sample use a head pointer to touch a screen it can also has ability to work with a sip and puff device although we don't provide those so typically people would have their own but you can plug it into a port on the device if that's how somebody would have to have to vote um, now persons 
voters are entitled to assistance in most states, including Texas. And if you need assistance, you first of all tell an election official. If you say they will ask you why you need assistance, and you can say, I can't stand, I can't read, I can't, uh, I shake too bad, um, I can't read the ballot. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to give a doctor's excuse or any documentation. All you have to do is say to the election official, I need assistance or I need language. It can also be language assistance. Some of the reasons that people might be entitled to assistance are that they cannot read or write the ballot in the language in which it is written. In Fort Bend, we, uh, we provide ballots in English and Spanish, but we have people that do not speak those languages. They speak Urdu or um, some other, particularly South Asian language that uh, Vietnamese maybe, that we don't offer to our voters. Um, so they're entitled to somebody who can assist them. Uh, then that generally is, most people who have a language issue know they have a language issue. So somebody will come with them to the polls. Oftentimes it is a, a child or a grandchild or a friend and that a sister does not have, they could be 12 years old to read a ballot to them. And it's not required that they be a voter. Um, so not being able to read or write the language in which the ballot is printed is one reason. Also, if somebody has a physical disability that prevents them from reading or marking the ballot. Um, um, before I had LASIK surgery, if I left my glasses at home, I could not read a ballot. My arm was not long enough to vote. So there's people who maybe have a visual problem and can't read the fine print on some things. There's um, also people who can't stand long enough to go through a ballot. Um, there's people who perhaps shake too badly to mark a ballot correctly. Uh, so these are persons that would could ask for and receive assistance. Now, a voter can be assisted by anybody of their choosing, pretty much, or election workers. Now, if a voter asks for assistance, the election worker would ask, do you have somebody you wish to assist you? If they don't, then they would ask, may we assist you? And generally the voter would say yes. There's a kind of caveat here in that voters cannot be assisted by their employer, an agent of their employer, an agent of their labor union. And that's true in most states. And that just makes sense in that somebody who, if your boss or your labor boss or whatever knows how you vote or don't vote, you can be subject to some economic penalties or sanctions. Now, what can assistors, assistors do? As I mentioned, the voter has to ask for assistance. One of the things we run into in, in our, in everywhere in the country, but maybe it's worse in our county, is that uh, people just assume that their spouse needs assistance. And so they'll vote their ballot and then they'll move over to the booth and try to help their, their husband or their wife vote. Unless that spouse asked for it, that's not permitted under Texas law. Um, also, a person assisting a voter under Texas law has to read the entire ballot to them unless the voter requests otherwise. In other words, you, being a sister, you couldn't just say, well, you know, we're going to vote. For, I'm a, who do you want to vote for for governor? And then stop. You have to go through the whole ballot with them unless the voter says, well, that's all. I just came here to vote for governor. I don't want to vote for anybody else. Also, the assister has to take an oath that that, that oath says that they will not try to influence the way the voters is their choices, and that they will also mark the ballot as the voter directs. In other words, they, the voter won't say, I want to vote for Bill, and you mark the ballot for Tom. That and that and That's an issue. It's not, we don't feel like that's a big issue in Fort Bend, but it's probably more of an issue with ballot by mail. Now, if you are, somebody is assisting you, or if you are assisting someone, it is a crime to try to influence that voter's vote. In other words, if, if you're assisting Mary who can't stand or can't reach the machine or can't see very well, and she says, I want to vote for Bill, and you say, oh, no, you don't. You should vote for Tom. That's a crime. If you mark the ballot other than how they ask you to, that's a crime. And it's also a crime to tell somebody 
how that person voted. In other words, to go out and say, well, I helped Mrs. Smith and she voted for, she voted straight Republican or she voted for mostly Democrats. That's, that's illegal. Now, we also offer what's called curbside voting. Curbside voting, we have a special marking device, for the voting device for that. But this is for a person who's physically unable to get into the polling place or into the voting area. In some cases, it might, could be offered if somebody can get in the door of the building, but maybe there's two steps into the, for the voting area and they can't get there, or maybe the elevator's out of order. So they could request a ballot be brought to them at the closest point they can get to the, to the polling place or to the voting area, which generally would be a car uh, or a van. Um, now, just because you, you're lazy and you don't want to walk in, you're not entitled to curbside voting. Because it's raining, you're not entitled, and you don't want to get wet, you're not entitled to curbside. In fact, because we use an electronic device, if it's we got a hard rain, we will not do curbside in the rain. It just it doesn't make sense, particularly during early voting. Um, but again, the uh, it is an option available for persons who cannot get into the building. Maybe you're wheelchair bound, and um, actually all of our sites are wheelchair accessible. But if for some reason we had one that was not was not, then persons who were in a wheelchair would be certainly entitled to ask for curbside. Now, a lot of folks vote by mail. It's not vote by mail is, is one area in Texas that we don't have nearly as many people voting per population as do other states. Uh, in California, a lot of people vote by mail. Colorado, Oregon, Washington, almost everybody votes by mail. But in Texas, anybody who's 65 years of age or older, or any voter with a disability, and that disability doesn't have to be proven, you just have to say you're disabled, qualifies for a ballot by mail. Also, voters who will be absent from their county of residence on election day and during the early voting period can request a ballot be sent to their out of county address. We also have, if you're in, in jail, if you're incarcerated waiting to, or at a waiting trial, you can also request a ballot by mail. Although um, I did an open records request recently and went back 10 years and we've never had anybody in jail who's awaiting sentencing or awaiting trial rather request a, a ballot. If they're in jail because they've been convicted of a felony, they're not eligible. Now, to apply by a ballot by mail, well, there is a Texas application, a standard application, but you don't have to use it. Uh, there has to be some commonality. I mean, you could write a letter and say, I want a ballot by mail, but you have, has to be in writing and it has to bear your signature. It has to be submitted in person by you or by mail. Your spouse, your husband, or your friend cannot bring in your application. You have to do that yourself or mail it. We cannot accept an application within the 11 days before an election. And that makes sense because there's not time to process it, get it to you, and you get it back to us. Persons who are out of town must apply for a ballot for each election. In other words, if you're out of town for the city school election, you can get a ballot, apply for that ballot. Now, that would cover if there's a, a runoff election, but you may have to apply several times during the year. If you're disabled or you're over 65, you can submit one annual application each year. In other words, you can submit it in January and we'll send you a ballot for every election in which you're eligible to vote. So you might get two ballots, a minimum, you might get six or seven, depending on how many political subdivisions actually hold elections. All these app annual applications expire at the end of the year. So if you applied in January, you're, normally your last ballot would be for the November 8th election. If you were in a city, for example, Missouri City, and they had a runoff in December, you would also get a ballot for that. They won't have one in December because they only have two people running for each office. But it normally it, it, there may be some that do. Um, but again, come January 1, you would have to, if you wanted balance in 2023, you have to submit a new annual application. 
Um, if you need to help filling this application out, you can ask somebody to help you. Um, we would suggest you don't have a stranger doing that or somebody's coming door to door asking you if you want to vote by mail. We would discourage that. But again, you, if they, somebody does assist you in filling out an application, they have to, that is, person has to enter their name and address by your signature on the application. There's a place to do so. Um, and again, we, we do see, and you probably, you may well receive what's called a pre-printed application from a candidate in a political party that already has your information there. All you have to do is add a little bit, sign it and mail it in. Um, that's perfectly legal. Sometimes people are concerned about the legality, but it is okay. Um, applications for ballot by mail must also include one of the following identifying numbers. Now, this was this is a new law that started January 1 last year, and it created a lot of confusion. But on both the application and on the envelope in which you return your ballot, there's a spot to enter one of these numbers your Texas driver's license number, your election identification number, which I said, as far as I know, nobody in the county has one, or the last four digits of your social security. We encourage people to enter both their driver's license or their ID number and the four digits of the social. When you, we receive your application, we have to verify that the number you give, give us matches the number we have in our records. Well, some people may, when they register to vote, provide a driver's license number. Some may have provided a social. Um, if you registered 20 years ago, you may not remember. If you give us one and we don't have it, we will have to reject that application and tell you to try again. So if you give us both numbers, you increase the likelihood that that's going to be accepted. But that goes on the application. Now, once you, your application has been received and process, what happens? Well, about 40 days before an election, we'll begin mailing ballots to people who submitted a valid application. 45 days before the election, if we have for overseas or military voters, we by law have to put those in the mail. But sometimes people will apply in July and come 1st of August, they contact and say, I haven't got my ballot yet. We don't even know what's going to be on the ballot. So it, it's usually about 40 days before before we have that ready. Um, the, in general, a ballot has to be mailed to the address at which you're registered. If you are 65 or disabled, you can have the ballot sent to your home. You can have it sent to a hospital, a long care, long-term care facility, a retirement center, or to the home of a relative. If you're absent from the county in Texas, and this is where we are much more strict than most other states, the ballot can only be mailed to an address outside the county. In other words, you can't say, I live in Sugarland, but I'm going to go to Great Britain for the month of October and I won't be back till mid-September. Send me a ballot to my home. We cannot do that. We can send you a ballot to Great Britain, but we can't send one to you here. Um, the, uh, that, again, that's kind of a, a Texas thing, uh, but it does make for persons who are traveling a little bit harder to, to vote by mail because if you're on the road, it's very difficult to know where you're going to be in advance. But again, that, that's not our rule, but that's Texas law. So if you're voting by mail or want to because you're absent from the county, you have to, uh, it, I remember a number of years ago, we have a, uh, I won't say their name, but they're a well-known rock band here in Fort Bend County and they were, performing different cities every night. And we had a heck of a time getting ballots to them. I think we eventually sent them to Disney World, but uh, uh, because that's where they were gonna be for two days at doing concerts. So it's um, it can be a challenge. Um, what if you need help in marking that ballot? Maybe you needed help in getting, filling out the application, maybe you didn't, but you get the ballot and you're, you, you can't read it, you can't, mark it, you're afraid you'll mess it up, or you can't get out of the house to mail. You can ask a friend or a relative to, to help you do so. Now, if somebody mark, helps you mark the ballot or reads the ballot to you or mails it for you, you have to put that person's name and address on the carrier envelope, which is used to send the ballot 
back to us. Um, if you cannot sign your application <clears throat> or, or the return ballot envelope, you can make a mark. In other words, you could, you could do, all you can do is a X or a scribble um, that's not legible as your name. Somebody can witness that and say, yes, that is Bill's mark. If they do that, they also have to, like a sister, have to provide their, provide their name and also their relationship. Like that could be a friend, it could be um, parent or child, it could be, you know, sibling, whatever. Now to return your ballot, it has to come back in the envelope that we provide. When we mail it to you, it'll have an outside envelope, then it'll have a what's called a secrecy envelope in which you can put your ballot, but it's only to conceal it. So when the, we open the carrier envelope coming back, we don't see how you vote. Um, there'll be instructions and some other documents, and then there'll be a carrier envelope for you to return your ballot back in. You have to put the identifying number, again, the driver's license number or the last four of your social on a space provided on that envelope. And that's our envelopes have a dual flap. So somebody who sees that envelope can't see that identifying information, but you do have to have it on there. Uh, also, you can track your application and your ballot status, whether it's been mailed to you, whether it's been returned, whether it's been approved by the ballot board, whether it's been counted on our website or on the votetexas.gov website. There's, there's what's called a ballot tracker on both sides. Now, for more information about voting, voting by mail, registering, you can go to our website, www.fortbenvotes.org or to www.fortvotetexas.gov. Both of these sites uh, have much of the same information I presented today, but more detailed information as well. On our site, the www.fortben, It'll have an early voting schedule with the listing the 28 uh, early voting sites, their hours. Um, it will also eventually have the election day sites where you can go and vote. It will also have a, like a Google map showing you where these sites are so you can see what's closest to you if you choose to vote in person. Um, you can download applications for ballot by mail. You can download voter registration forms from these sites as well. So at this point, I'm. I think we have about 12 minutes, 11 minutes left, and we'll save this time in case anybody else has any questions. Uh, thank you so much for this information, John. There's, it, it is, there's quite a bit of information, isn't there? I guess you really don't realize it until you get into. There just... is, and I just covered the highlights, so. <laughs> Very good. Well, so the Fort Bend. So for the fortbendvotes.org, that would be where people will go to see our website, know, yes. The um, perhaps locations. Does it show maps? Of basically right. where you the different can find all kinds of information on there. If you troll around, you can see uh, you can find candidate. If you're interested in who's financially supporting candidates, you can see there for local candidates their campaign finance information. You can see when who's up for election and say in which county offices in 2024. Um, you can get information about um, sign ordinances and our municipalities because our every one of our municipalities has different ordinance regarding candidate signs and um, Texas Department of Public Safety has um, sign ordinances related to campaign signs, so on and so forth. So there's there, we also have links to the League of Women Voters, Fort Bend Voters League, Secretary of State, political parties. You can find information about running for office. Uh, there's there's a bunch of stuff there. So if, if you know if it's a rainy day and you have nothing better to do, you can go troll around on that website. So, uh, well, that sounds like a great resource. Um, and so if we not seeing any questions in our chat box. So if we did have anybody had had a question, feel free to jump in. But um, if not, I, I think um, another good way to kind of uh, get this information or answer some of those questions would be that that website, portbendvotes.org. 
And John, I just want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for um, explaining a lot of what goes on behind the scenes and, and preparing people for for voting and, and what their uh, what the process looks like. And um, it's a great also, amount of we, I, Let me mention, I'll interrupt you. We will also eventually have for this election what are called sample ballots on our website. Now there'll be a lot of them. And so oftentimes you may know where you live and you know make um, in some cases, there may be only one sample per precinct. Um, but if you don't know, you can go to what's called check my registration, look yourself up and then link to your current sample ballot for whatever election is, is going on right now. Um, and so that's a good tool. It'll also tell you, help you find out if you're registered, maybe you're on suspense and you want to get that dealt with. Um, Maybe you find out you thought you're registered, but you're not. Uh, sometimes people, a lot of times people move from one county to another and they just assume their registration magically follows them, but it doesn't. It's, you have to be proactive and, and making sure you're registered and registering. Um, just because you get a license at DPS does not mean you're registered. You have, they actually have a, it's easy to do, but you have a checkbox to say, yes, I want to register or no, I decline. So sometimes people fail to mark that and they think they're registered and they're not. So um, also we mail out new voter certificates. That's a little voter card every two years in December to January. And um, although that card is no longer generally used as identification, the reason we do that is to help try to keep our voter rolls clean. So that's another reason you want to update your registration if you move. If we mail it to you, it's a non-forwardable piece of mail and it comes back to us as undeliverable. We then put you on suspense and after two federal elections, you may get canceled. So um, it, it's very important that people let us know if you change your residence. Now you can actually still vote if you've moved within the county. Uh, if say you move from Fulshire to Sugarland and you go in to vote and, and you're gonna get a ballot for Fulshire, but you can still vote, uh, but you can update your registration address when you vote at that site for future elections. Very good to know. So people, if they don't realize that they've like you said, they've they've moved and they haven't updated it. They can do so at in that moment at that time if they're within the yeah. Account. And we do have there's a lot of different registration agencies. Every almost every public service agency, Department of Public Health, Department of Social Services, uh, all our libraries have voter registration forms. Our high schools are also supposed to have voter registration forms where people can fill them out, mail, put them in the mail and you'll eventually get registered. We also have lots of what's called volunteer deputy registrars. And I had slides on these, I must have skipped them some way or another. Uh, volunteer deputy registrars who are empowered to go train and empowered to go out and re register people to vote. Uh, they can come to your meetings and go to, um, door to door and register people. So we have, a, there's a lot of registration and you can register. We don't have online registration in Texas per se but you can update your registration uh, through DPS or on the Secretary of State's website. If you move from one place to another, you can do that online, but you can't, if you move from say Harris County to Fort Bend County, you have to register anew. You, your registration does not transfer and all your registration forms have to have what's called a wet signature. It can't be a, a digital signature and electronic signature. Yeah. Again, a great amount of information. Thank you so much, John. We appreciate your time. And Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure to talk with you.